Um, so if you have been following along these last um, four or five weeks, I'm not sure where we're at um, as far as the number of weeks we've been in, but um, we, we, we've been walking through this book of Hebrews. Now Hebrews is um, actually, as I was just saying in, in the prayer, it, Hebrews is actually a sermon, uh, a sermon written to Hebrew Christians and, and Hebrew Jewish people who uh, either were already Christians or were, you know, close within the community of the church, maybe thinking about becoming Christians, walking along beside that. Um, this book was written to them to um, kind of, for one thing, kind of show them more clearly who Jesus actually is. And so we named this series Jesus Is um, in that regard so that we could kind of walk through this book looking at all the things that the author of Hebrews tells us Jesus is, who he is for us, what he's done for us, and now how he, how he still continues to live and work on our behalf with the Father, at the right hand of the Father in heaven, working on our behalf, mediating for us for all time. The last two weeks um, have really been about that. And so here's a quick recap. Um, the first thing we talked about that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. The, the book of Hebrews opens up just kind of laying this out before us. Um, man, I just want to read this little first paragraph. Here's what it says. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. This is Jesus. He is, the son is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. So Jesus is God, right? And then, and then the author of Hebrews is kind of laying out for us what that means. Jesus is superior to all other beings in existence in the universe. He talks about him being superior to angels. He talks about him being superior to Moses or all the prophets of old, all the Old Testament figures and characters, and even Jesus being superior to all the sacrifices that the Israelites had offered over the last 1,500, 1,600 years that Jesus is now our superior sacrifice, and Jesus is our superior high priest who offers that sacrifice. All these things we have walked through I'm in the last nine chapters of Hebrews, now getting into chapter 10. And I want to read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Um, hopefully this will be up on the screen. Um, and if you, if you got a Bible, just follow along with me um, right there in your, in your Bibles. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, it says this. It says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason... It can never, by the same sacrifices, repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Jesus as our perfect sacrifice and our perfect high priest. To the Jews, this would be very understood language, right? I, I know that we do not um, fully kind of grasp the reality of what that looked like day to day uh, for the Jewish people because we are not Jewish and we are not living in the first century. Um, and we had not kind of had this history, this long history of coming and offering sacrifices through a mediator called the, the priests, the priesthood and the high priest in particular. That was the only person who could offer certain sacrifices for the atonement for the sins of the people. But this is what he's talking about. That their entire history for thousands of years, this is what they needed to do in order to draw near to God. In order to come and be right with him, even temporarily, he says. This was all temporary. But they had to do this day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year to come and offer their sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins. So here he's reminding the Jews that all of their sacrificing over the last 1,500 years or so, has only been, he says, a shadow of the things that were to come. In other words, you can kind of put it like this, that the entire Old Testament, the laws and the rituals and the institutions of the Old Testament all pointed to one ultimate reality. And that ultimate reality is really a person, and his name is what? Jesus. All of this pointing us to Jesus. This is why you guys know the story of the transfiguration. 
uh, Luke chapter 9 in the transfiguration. Jesus takes with him uh, James and John and Peter, and they go up on this mountain. And when they go up on this mountain, Jesus is transfigured before them. And they kind of see him really ultimately for who he is. He's glowing. He's bright. He's glorious. His cloud wraps around him. And then standing there with Jesus are two other people. It's Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus. And then they hear the voice of the Father in the midst of this cloud, right? Luke chapter 9, go read this. They hear the voice of the Father, and what does the Father say to them? He says, this is my son, listen to him. He didn't even reference that Elijah and Moses are there, right? Like Elijah, the greatest prophet in the history of Israel, and Moses, the greatest leader, the writer of the law. These two men represented the entire Old Testament, law and prophets. And God, when he speaks, he speaks only about who? His son. This is the one. And he says, this is my son. He says, listen to him, Jesus. So it all points us to Jesus. And so As we've been talking about the sacrifices in the high priesthood in chapters 4 through 9 of Hebrews, um, the sacrifices in the priesthood, here's the problem with those two things. Here's the problem with the sacrifices and the problem with the priesthood. It's this. The sacrifices that were offered, goats and bulls and lambs and rams or pigeons or whatever they would offer, all of those sacrifices, they were sinless because animals are sinless. Animals do not sin. I don't know if you guys know this. I have a dog. He ate a chocolate cake once. I think that was a sin. But animals don't really sin, right? They actually don't. And that's a good thing so that the sacrifices that they were offering were sinless. But here's the problem with those sacrifices. They weren't human. So if a sacrifice would ever take away human sin perfectly, it would have to be sinless and human. And here's the problem with the high priests. The problem with the high priests were that they were human, and yet they were not sinless. They were sinful men. So we had sacrifices that were sinless, but not human. And we had priests that were human, but not sinless. You you see the problem working out here. That as the writer of Hebrews is trying to get them to understand, there's, there's an issue with this entire system. Now, God put it in place to be a shadow of the thing that was to come in Christ. God put it in place to be helpful for them. And yet, the sacrifices and the priesthood, they they weren't perfect. They weren't complete. Because the sacrifice couldn't just be sinless. It had to also be human if it would ever be perfectly sufficient to take away human sin. And the priest who offered it couldn't just be human. He would have to also be sinless if he would be worthy to offer a perfect sacrifice. And so it follows that the only one worthy of such standards, perfect and human, would be the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. And he is not just worthy to be either sacrificed or priest. He is worthy to be both. And he is both. Again, this is Hebrews 4 through 9, that Jesus is both of these things for us. He is the only sinless sacrifice who is also human. He is the only human priest who is also sinless, the God-man, Jesus. He is the perfect high priest who could offer the perfect sacrifice, namely himself on a cross. This is why the author of Hebrews goes through such great lengths in chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to explain to us that Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the perfection of all the religious laws and institutions of the Jews. He is the final sacrifice, the eternal high priest. And so there would never be another need for another sacrifice or another priest. There would never be a need for that. And praise God, none of us had to bring a bull this morning, right? I have two cows. They're glad that this is over, right? They're glad. I got four goats. They're glad that this is over. All I need from them is milk, not atonement, right? That's it. No more sacrificing. No more high priest. And so here's the question. What did, what did Jesus' sacrifice offer and accomplish for us? What did his sacrifice, as he being high priest who offered himself the perfect sacrifice, what did that accomplish for us? Romans 6.23 says this. It says that the wages of sin is death, right? Where there is sin, 
there must be death as payment. This is how God has created his economy to work. That where sin exists, death exists. He said this from the very beginning to Adam and Eve. What did he tell them? You do what I say or you will surely die. And so our death really is the payment for our sin. And again, God set up this temporary system for 1,500 years for the Jews that they could pay for their sin through the death of another. The, the substitutionary death of an innocent sacrifice is a common theme throughout Scripture, even from the garden, right? Adam and Eve's sin, God had told them, you will surely die. And yet, what's the first thing that dies? A, an innocent animal to cover their nakedness and shame. Not them, right? From the very beginning, God was showing them, I have an actual gospel that I want you to get. I want you to see and I want you to understand that your sin, though it requires death and blood and payment, will be paid by another. I will pay the price for this. Right? And so God had given Israel this temporary form of payment in the blood of animals that they sacrificed throughout their history. Now, I did some math, okay? Um, and I thought about this. So, just if we just take the bulls that they would have sacrificed regularly, okay? If we just take the bulls for about 1,500 years, you know, we're going we're to whittle it down to 1,000 years. Let's just say 1,000 years of sacrificing bulls. And let's say they sacrificed 1,000 bulls a year for 1,000 years. What's 1,000 times 1,000? Anybody? 1 million right? Now, how many gallons of blood does a bull have? About 10. That's 10 million gallons of blood. That's about 15 Olympic swimming pools full of blood. That's just bulls. And that's subtracting 500 years of sacrifices. That's not including rams and goats and lambs and pigeons. That's not including all the other animals that they would have sacrificed. That's not including the grain offerings that they would have given. All of their food that they would have given to the Lord. That is just bulls, just for a thousand years. Ten million gallons of blood. How many pints of blood are in the human body? About eight to ten. Jesus eight pints is greater than 10 million gallons of bull blood of any other animal blood that exists. Here's the way 1 Peter uh, says that. Flip over just uh, another book or two. 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, for you, were not, uh, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God paid the most valuable price with the most valuable currency that exists in the universe. What is that currency? The blood of his son. That is the cost. Jesus, eight pints, 10 pints of blood was the cost for all of your sin and all of my sin and all of the sin of every person who would ever live and every person who would ever come to him in faith that the millions and millions and millions of gallons of blood of every other animal that had ever been sacrificed, it could only hold us over until the time that Jesus would come and then finally, eternally offer himself as the perfect atoning sacrifice. This is known as the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. You want kind of a churchy term there. Substitutionary atonement. Atonement, that Jesus acted as our substitute, taking our place of punishment for the sins that we committed. And taking those sins upon himself, he atoned for those sins. That means he, he paid for those sins with his own blood. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf, that we might become in him the righteousness of of God. That is substitutionary atonement. That teaches that in that moment, Jesus not only took the punishment for our sins, he really took the guilt of our sins. Do you get this? Do you understand this, uh, this, this reality of the gospel message to us? Jesus didn't just take the punishment. He took the guilt of your sin. Really? Here, here's the question. Was Jesus guilty of sin when he died? Yes, he was your sin. 
He was guilty of your sin, not his. He never committed sin. Perfect. Because here's the reality. If you don't understand this, this is why doctrine matters, guys. This is why theology is so important. That's why we're singing these songs today, and I'm so excited. I wish you guys knew the message before while we were singing, because I'm singing it, and I know the message, and I know these scriptures, and I'm just so happy as we're singing those songs. Praise be to the one who is worthy of all of our honor and glory, right? I understand this because when we get this, we understand that the guilt that we have incurred by our sins was put on Jesus on the cross, really guilty. And if that's not true, listen, if it's not true that Jesus was really guilty of your sin, then it can't be true that you're really not guilty of sin. You are only really not guilty of sin because Jesus was really guilty of your sin. That is the gospel. And that is why on that cross he incurred the wrath of God. God would be unjust if he punished Jesus without the guilt of our sin on him. He had to be guilty of something. Not his own sin, yours. And so, because he received our sin, what do we receive? God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the what? The righteousness of God in him. He received the guilt. We received the righteousness. We received a right standing, guiltless, sinless before God. Here's a question. Here's a theology question. Does anybody who is not perfect go to heaven? Does anybody who is not perfect go to heaven? The answer is no. If you're not perfect, you can't go to heaven. But what's the problem with that? None of us are perfect in ourselves. And yet, through Jesus' sacrifice, you and I have been given a perfection in righteousness by his blood. Not our perfection, his perfection, but really given to us because he really took our guilt, right? Guys, this is the gospel and that's what substitutionary atonement means. And again, that matters because if Jesus didn't really take the guilt of your sins, then it's still on you. But if you really did, then you get the righteousness of Christ, You have received that through faith in Jesus Christ. You are holy and perfect and complete. Romans 3, 21 through 26, it says this. I'm going to read this for us. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Just because this is um, maybe of any paragraph in the Bible, this is um, just the most significant. It says, but now... A righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. There's, there's Moses and Elijah, right? Testifying to Jesus. Verse 22, Romans 3, it says, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely. You know what that means? Made completely free of sin. You, in the eyes of God, are sinless in Christ's blood, perfect in Jesus, by his grace, through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, he says this. This is on the screen. Just listen. Because I, I just, I just want, to, I want to drill this into your mind and your heart today. For what the law was powerless to do, this is Romans 8, 3. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Jesus was a sin offering. That means your sins were put on him. He was guilty of everything you've ever done, right? He was a sin offering, and so God condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous, listen to this, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. He just said that when you have faith in Jesus, the righteous requirements of the law, the law requires you to be perfect, 
to be righteous. Jesus said, Matthew chapter five, unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, you will never get into heaven. And in that same chapter, he said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And he was alluding to this, that through faith in Jesus, the righteous requirements of the law, everything that the law tells you to do to be perfect would be actually met in you because you have faith in Jesus. Not because you're actually perfect, because Jesus is perfect and you are in him. Ephesians chapter two says, we are seated at the right hand of the father in Christ right now. Perfect, right? And Romans 8.30 says this, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. Do you realize that that is written in the past tense? You were already glorified. When you put your faith in Jesus, made sinless, made perfect in the eyes of God, positionally holy. Now, you are not practically holy, right? You are not practically perfect. And so the doctrine of the New Testament is this. Live as best you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. Live according to what you already are. You are already holy. You are already perfect. You are already free. You are already sinless. Now live like it. And when you don't, you repent and you trust in Jesus tomorrow the same as you do today. And you just keep doing that day by day, trusting that the blood of Jesus has actually forgiven every sin. Listen, not just the sins you already committed, the sins you will commit today, but also the sins you will commit in 80 years if you live that much longer right? He has forgiven every sin. And in him, by his blood, you are perfect and holy. And if you don't believe that, let's go back to Hebrews 10. He says this. I'm going to read verses 14 through 18. He says, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Could it be said clearer than that? That he has made you perfect forever and he is still making you holy. Do you get this? Be what you already are. You are holy in the eyes of God. Now live like that. And here's, he goes on. He says, the Holy Spirit testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts. Listen, I will remember no more. And when these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. I should have heard way more than one amen to that. There is no more sacrifice for sin. It is done. It is complete. That word perfect that he uses in Hebrews, it's the same root word that Jesus used on the cross. It is finished. Complete. Done. Forever. Perfect. And so, that's my introduction. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you get called on to preach last minute. You never know if it's going to be really short or really long. Um, no, we're, we're actually winding down. But this is, listen, this is where the, the book of Hebrews turns to start to get to application, right? He has spent 10 and a half, uh, nine, nine and a half chapters doing doctrine. He has spent nine and a half chapters going, this is who Jesus is. Look at him, see him, understand him. Know that there is no more sacrifice left. Jews, Hebrew people understand that for 1500 years, our people had to come and come and go and go and offer and offer and sacrifice and sacrifice and it's done. Because Jesus did what he did, and now can we turn to some application? I love the way the New Testament writers write because they always, man, they give us things to do. They tell us what to do, but before they tell us what to do, they always show us who Jesus is. So that we don't do what we do out of legalism. We do what we do out of worship and praise to Jesus, right? We want to live our lives for him because of who he is. This is is why Jesus is our confidence. 
Hebrews 1 through 9 through 10, right? This is why Jesus is our confidence because of all that he is. We have confidence in him, y'all. This is why, this is why we sing. This is why we worship. Y'all, why, why didn't we sing today? Why didn't we sing this? Whom the sun sets free is free, sort of. Why is that not the words of the song? Because it's not true that way, is it? Whom the sun sets free is free what? Indeed. Is free, amen. That's really what the word amen means, indeed. It's free, amen. We're free. We're saved in Christ, perfect and holy in him positionally forever in the eyes of our Father. What would change about your life if you actually believed that? What would change in your life if you believed today that God sees you as perfect in his son Jesus? That you don't have to earn his love. You don't have to earn his approval. That's what righteousness means, approved by God. That's who you are. What would change about you? Where would your guilt go? Where would your shame go? Where would all that sin that you constantly feel like you'll never have, have an upper hand on, all those things that you constantly feel like are just going to keep eating your lunch every day, all those things that you struggle with, everything that you're kind of keeping hidden in secret, where would all those things go if you actually believe that you are perfect in Jesus, complete in him, and now being made holy to live according to what you already are? So the author of Hebrews turns in 10, 19 through 39, to kind of give us some application here. And I'm just going to give you five things to close out. Here they are. Number one, what is the application of all of this? Number one is draw near to God. He says, draw near to God. Therefore, he says, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full of assurance. That's confidence, full of the assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Do you have a guilty conscience this morning? Listen, if you're in Jesus, you can draw near to him without that guilt, without that on your conscience, weighing whatever you did yesterday, that was yesterday and it's gone. And Jesus' blood has still forgiven you today. Draw near to him with confidence. Number two, hold fast to your confession. Hold fast to your confession. He says in verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. He's just saying, man, hold fast to that, that, that confidence that you have in Jesus because he's faithful and his faithfulness will never end. No one's ever going to pull you out of his hand. No one's ever going to make you stop being a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. We sang it, right? That's never going to not be true of you if you are in Christ. So hold fast to that confession. I love 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. He says, God sanctifies you through and through. And he says, he is faithful. He will do it. That's a promise. He's going to get you to the end in Christ. Number three, stir up one another to love and good works. Verses 24 and 25. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good works. Deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. That word spur, spur on, it literally means to like shove, right? That sometimes you and I need somebody who loves Jesus along beside us to just go, start living like it, right? Come on, let's go. Let's do the things that he's called us to do. Let's walk out. Listen, Christianity is not lived in here. It's lived out there to go do the things that he's called us to do and be the people he's called us to be, not out of legalism, not out of obligation, but out of worship to him, the one who has made us holy and perfect in his blood, right? So preach the gospel to each other. Don't just hear the gospel on Sunday mornings. Read it every day in your Bibles and preach it to one another throughout the week. Preach the gospel to your preachers as often as you can. Remind one another who Jesus is and what he has done. And he says, be together. Don't stop meeting together. Church, come to church. Okay. Number four, don't continue in sin. Don't continue in sin. 
And this is one of the scariest passages of the Bible, so I'm just going to read these verses and let them sit for a second. Hebrews 10, 26 says this. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Don't continue in that. Whatever that, whatever that sin is that you've just allowed to kind of make its home in you, that you haven't brought before the feet of Jesus and repented of and turned away from, he says, if you would continue in that deliberately, the, the idea is just simply that you would make up your mind to say, I'm not repenting of that. I'm going to walk in this sin. I don't care. And he says, you nullify the grace of God. Later in that paragraph, he says, you insult the spirit of grace. The grace of Jesus, what he has done for us, is not an excuse to sin. It is the best reason not to. Guys, this is why, this is why we tell you to read your Bibles. This is why we encourage you to continue meeting together. Because if we're not continually reminded of who Jesus is, then our hearts will start to stray. And we will so easily forget. Y'all know we're forgetful people, right? And we will so easily forget and sin becomes more and more attractive the less we see Jesus. And I just want to say this as plainly as I can. If you make up your mind that you're going to continue in sin, whatever that looks like, you will go to hell. That's the only expectation you can have. But if you see Jesus for who he is, and that causes your heart to rejoice and know that his blood has covered every sin. That you are made holy and perfect in him. Then you will spend your life being sanctified by his spirit to walk in the holiness that you already have been given in Christ. So lay it down. No, you're not going to practically be perfect in this world but you already are perfect positionally in heaven, so start living that way. And if you need help, ask a brother or sister. Let's do that together. Ain't nobody in this room figured it out all the way, okay? So let's just do this together. And the last thing is this. Look to the reward. Verse 35 says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are those who believe and are saved. Don't shrink back. Don't throw away your confidence for the things of this world that fade, the promises of this world that will never be kept. Don't throw away your confidence for that thing that you're keeping hidden right now. Don't throw away your confidence for that temporary moment, that pleasure that feels good for five seconds and then leaves nothing but guilt and shame until the next time. Don't throw away your confidence pursue Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to his 10 pints that were enough to cover forever and make perfect those who are being made holy. You and me. 
You guys pray with me. Lord God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his blood that has covered our sins, that has forever forgiven us and made us perfect. Oh God, help us to see that so clearly, see Jesus so clearly in your word and in the community of one another, that we would just see Jesus and so live our lives with confidence in him, not in ourselves, not on our best day do we have confidence in ourselves, but only in your son Jesus, who has made atonement for our sins by his blood. Praise be to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. God, let our confidence rest in him. In Jesus' name, amen. So Father God, we just thank you again that you are our righteousness. You're our only hope of salvation. Not one of us in this room has done one thing to earn our salvation, not one thing to pay for our sins. You have done everything by the blood of your son, the precious blood of Christ. Put our confidence in him today as we walk out these doors and let us be so confident and so joyful in Jesus that we would just not be able to not share that with others. Let us go share it. Let us love and serve. Let us be salt and light into this world because we are your children, saved by your grace through the blood of your son. God, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, y'all, thank you so much for being here today. If you would like a prayer conversation, anything like that, I'm gonna hang out right here. I know Scott will be around or other pastors in the room, so just come. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Love you guys. Have a great Sunday.